The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Good morning and welcome to Southside Bible Church. Grateful for any visitors who've come to worship with us. We hope you'll feel welcomed and loved while you're here worshiping God with us. As a church, we're studying through 2 Peter, if you will turn there. This morning, I'm hoping to finish up chapter 2. And this chapter that we've been looking at has been quite a sobering warning. It's been very strong and cutting. And in our time today, we're going to kind of hit the peak of this warning that Peter has been bringing to us, and it's very powerful. These are not the passages really that you would pick out if you were preaching topically, but they're the ones that the Spirit of God sees fit that we need as a church to finish our, our journey to glory. And so warnings are necessary to the people of God. In heaven, we're going to be made perfect, and we will never need another warning for all of eternity. We'll never drift. We'll never be prone to wander ever again. But because of the world, the flesh, and the devil, warnings are necessary for God's children. True believers hear warnings, and they heed it. It can hurt. It can even scare. It can bring some fear, and it can awaken can even frighten because of the weightiness of it, but it should lead to repentance and it should lead to alertness. False children, when they hear these things, they ignore it, they scoff, they see it for someone else and they let it bounce off because there's no weight to their hearts and they just continue down the wrong path. I've always used that illustration of warnings as a, the bowling alley when you were a kid and they used to put up the bumpers. And so they're, they're there to keep us from going in the gutter. They're they're very necessary to the children of God. So in chapter 1, the mercies and the blessings that have come in Christ, and in chapter 2, the rails go up to keep us from drifting and wandering into air and, and going away from this sweet Christ that we love so much. And so my desire for this morning is to study our text and to get a true understanding of what God wants for us this morning. And then we're going to come to the table, the Lord's table for times of healing and times of refreshment, to to wound in the Word of God and then heal at the table of our Lord. And so the redeemed of the Lord will let this passage cut off flesh that may be growing in your own heart this morning. And so may God work in all of our hearts powerfully this morning as He has in mind in the journey through this study. Uh, It's an uncomfortable setting, an uncomfortable passage, and so may my flesh not try to take the power of God away from the church of God this morning. And for that, let's go before our King. Father, Son, Spirit, we come joyfully before You because of the work of Christ. We stand blameless with great joy in Your presence even this morning. Oh God, I thank You for this Gospel of Jesus Christ. I thank You for a full acceptance. Lord, if we could look right into Your heart, there is not even a drop of enmity left toward Your children. God, every drop of it was poured out in that cup that Jesus Christ drank on our behalf on a tree. Oh God, thank you that now we have peace with God. And I pray, Lord, that as we keep journeying in the the text this morning, that you will guide us into, into the kindness and the severity of our God. Lord, that we will marvel at your mercies, and yet we will never uh, tread lightly with the reverence that we should have for you as our God. And so, Lord, give the saints of God that blessed balance even this morning, the balance that no human being can find. Only the Spirit of God through your word can give us that. So let us walk the razor's edge of truth as the people of God. Meet us in this word, and let it be a time of worship, we pray now. Amen. Outline. The outline as we've been journeying through chapter 2 is in verses 1 through 3, we've seen the portrait of false teachers. They're going to be in our midst, they're going to deny the master, and they're going to be really driven by sensuality and greed. Our second aspect was in verses 4 through 10, and there Peter's showing us there will be punishment for these false teachers. They might look like they're getting it all in this world with riches and possessions and immoralities and all the stuff, but judgment is coming, and he went and traced through Genesis uh, the angels, the flood, and Sodom and Gomorrah that God knows how to judge these teachers. Thirdly, the presumption of these false teachers we looked at in verses 11 through 12, they're self-willed, they're daring, they revile angelic 
majesties. There's a pride to them. Then in verses 13 through 16, we looked, what are the practices of these false teachers? And they're just full of sensuality. They're just lust and greed, the the desires of the flesh. That is what drives these men and women of their false teaching. That's how they will live their lives. They look for a theology that will match their desires and their lusts so they can keep living in this way. Fifthly, then, we looked, like we didn't look, we will look this morning at their promises. I'm going to call it their preaching, their teaching. And in verses 17 through 19, we'll see that, and then we'll close out with what's the product? What is the, where's all this leading? Why does it matter? Why are we spending time looking and studying this? And I'll show you that eternity is at stake, and we need to take this seriously, and we need to wake up to this, this amazing exhortation that Peter is giving us by the Spirit of God. So let's take a look at the fifth point. The promises of false teacher, if you'll look with me in verse 17 of chapter 2. These are springs without water and mists driven by a storm for whom the black darkness has been reserved. (coughs) For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error. So how do these false teachers then get a following? It seems like no one would really go after their nonsense after what we've been studying. After chapter 1 of 2 Peter, who would follow these kind of teachers? We, we want the pure Word of God. Remember, it's inspired by the Spirit. Every word we have here is inspired by God. Who doesn't want the true, pure Word of God to guide them and lead them? That little lamp that we follow to glory. Who doesn't want that? It's what they promise where the danger comes. That's what makes them so seductive and so powerful. They offer what our flesh wants to hear, and every believer has remaining flesh. And so these messages can catch you and snag you and and barb you. And so what is palatable with our wrong desires is what they're throwing out there in their teaching. They lift what true teachers press on our minds and consciences about holiness and conformity to Christ. I sat in Sunday school in 1 Thessalonians 4, and it was beautiful, and it was true teaching, and I loved every bit of it. And and so when you hear that, and you hear this call to holiness, the false teachers want to come and lift that. The battle that ensues in pursuing after Christ's likeness till you get to glory is a fight, and it is a battle. Peter said, make every effort in chapter 1 to grow in these things and to strive in moral excellence and holiness and love. Journey hard. Go after them. And I'll tell you, it's tiring. I guarantee you some of you are sitting here saying, I am just tired of fighting for righteousness. It's exhausting. It's discouraging at times. I get these three steps forward and two back. It feels like it isn't working in certain seasons. I'm stroking against the the current of the ocean and I'm swimming so hard and I've gotten nowhere. It's tough. And the false teachers come along and they say, I'm going to give you some freedom from that. It's a powerful message and America loves its freedom. Don't touch it. And they come and they will promise that. When these teachers come and offer freedom... It takes a tired, weary soul that's fighting on its way to glory and it just sounds good. And you hear, rest, cease fire before the battle is over. It's not over till glory. And it's just so alluring to tired saints. And I've just seen it again and again in my season of shepherding. The flesh loves this stuff. I got a message for you so you don't have to fight any longer. Just float into glory. It feels so good. Wow, freedom to live any way you want. The cross has taken care of any punishment. You're just free. Quit being uptight and worrying about sin because God doesn't any longer. Well, let's look deeper then at what these false teachers then are going to promise. Look with me in verse 17. In the land of Palestine in the Persian Gulf area uh, is very desert. And it's very dry and very warm. And in the middle of these deserts and dry lands, there's springs, there's water. And and the rain, when it comes in, they're they're huge for survival in these deserty areas. And so this is the only way that you're going to live and survive and not die of thirst. And so these water sources are key to life in that region when this was being written by Peter. 
And so if you're traveling through the desert land, and you know there's a spring up ahead to water your horses and refill your canteens or whatever, and you get there, and the spring is dried up, there's no water, you are in big trouble. It's gonna, you're going to be in danger now. There's no water. I, I, I bet the young kids are not going to follow this, but there used to be a great show called Gunsmoke. And I can tell the older people know that show. I loved it. Matthew, Dillon, and Festus. And I remember one time they were in a desert. I think it was Festus. And he's seeing things. He's so thirsty and weary. And, and he would see, that there, here's the water right there. There's a big puddle, you know, a lake up there. And he would run up to it and he would fall down in the water and it was nothing but dry dirt. And it would just come in his mouth. He's hallucinating that there's water. And he says, you're, you're like these mists driven by a storm. So picture in this region that a, a fog then would roll in with clouds and, and you'd be like, thank you, Lord, the rain is coming. This is so vital for my life. But then no rain comes. Just the noonday sun and it burns off the fog and it drives out the clouds and all you have is dry, hot heat for the whole day. Can you imagine how disappointed you would be? It's hard to picture in Colorado right now, isn't it? But it's... Amen. Clouds without rain, such hope, and they brought nothing. And Peter takes these two illustrations that these people would understand so clearly. And what would be more disappointing to people in this region than this illustration? You just got these two possibilities with such promise. And you got a spring and you come to it and it's dry as a bone. And you have clouds and they bring no water and they just burn off. Both had such promise, and they brought nothing. Dry as a chip, drought, thirsting, and now you are in grave danger. And Peter comes and says, so are these false teachers. They come and they make glorious promises of drink and rest and, and, and everything that you could ever want. Here it is, I promise, water for your soul. The hope of great blessing. God saved you to give you health, Wealth and prosperity. What, uh, what myths that he's promising till these trials hit and destroy you. Freedom. To live any way that you want. No more effort. Just let go and let God. Here's these little formulas so you can grow. Here's your formula to bind Satan, to cast out the demons of lust and materialism. And here's all these formulas to get rid of any battle and fight. What's called Heaven. I believe in the prosperity gospel and it happens in heaven, okay? Everything, you're going to get it all. But not till then. You're going to suffer and you're going to deny and sacrifice till you get to glory. And so it just promises so much. A beautiful spring to a man in the desert, a cloud with great rain coming to fresh his soul. Well, thank you, God. But just like Festus, you are just left with dust in your mouth when you're done with these teachers. No water. Not being led to still waters and green pastures, you're led to wasteland. And I'll tell you this right now, you're worse off than you were before you heard this teaching. You drink what they're teaching, and you will die of thirst. And I've seen this played out so many times as a shepherd in the body of Christ. So hear very clearly the difference between 2 Peter chapter 1 and chapter 2. Because here's the difference between a true teacher and a false teacher. They promise they have, the false teacher is a waterless spring. The true teacher teaches you about a spring of living water in Christ that you abide and you commune and you drink and you fellowship and He never leaves you. You'll never thirst again when you drink from this Christ. That's what a true teacher will bring to you. The other, we've seen it six times in this context, it will bring destruction. It will bring a judgment that lie. And the other one, the true teacher, will bring your entrance into the kingdom of God will be abundantly supplied to you. Destruction, abundantly supplied as I enter in and walk into the fullness of glory forever with Christ. So many in churches, parched. Emotionalism without truth. You're left in a desert with no water. It just fills our land everywhere you turn. The church growth movement has left people parched. We grew big churches with parched people. That's what he's saying. It's false. 
the sin of not giving a church Jesus Christ is grave. And the pursuit of that Christ and conformity to Him is destruction to lose that. For the one who preaches this false message, Christ, without conformity to Him, for whom the blackness has been reserved. Eternal darkness, no light, forever. That's where this is going to lead to. That's what the false teachers are promised. Look with me in verse 18. For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, these false teachers then, here's their message. They entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality. Those who barely escape from the ones who live in error. So right here, they speak out arrogant words. They they come and they just sound so elegant and they smile while they tell you all this stuff. And they just sound so profound, so much knowledge and high-mindedness, and the secret decoder ring to figure out the Christian life that you need them to show you. Direct revelations they've heard from God, so you sit under them as authorities. Words, words, and more words, and they're all vanity. Words without even true meaning. These words are always denouncing other teachers. They sound so authoritative. Most have not been ordained. No accountability. They rule over people with churches like dictators. I had a gentleman one time in in our seminary where we were training him, and he went out and he just drifted from this message, and now he calls himself the only sound church in the state, and I'm going to plant sound churches everywhere so there's sound churches, and I'm the only guy who's sound. Awful. Their teaching promises so much And it never delivers the hearer's end disappointed sermon after sermon and there's no Christ and you dry up like a chip. Empty words that entice people to follow them and because of their profundity and their great understanding and the the promise of freedom at the end of it, people lap this stuff up and there's a freedom to sensuality and a freedom to greed and to quit fighting your flesh and mortifying it by the Spirit of God. They appeal to the motions and the lusts of their hearers. And they have created a teaching that allows for them to live this way. And so my question then is, who do these false teachers go after? Who do they go after? Well, last week we learned it's not the mature. It says here in our verse that it's those who barely escape from the ones who live in error. They don't go after the mature, growing, deep Christians but they go after the ones who are struggling. It says they're barely out from the world. They're these people who lived in indulgences and went crazy in sin, and they've barely come out from that lifestyle. That's the ones that they're going to go after. Long lives and sexual sin and promiscuity, those are the ones that they will run to. Those are the objects, the women with broken marriages, uh, people weighed down with guilt and sin and anxiety and problems. It's just like a duck on a June bug. They see these things and they go. I had a dear brother who had a guy who graduated from CCU as a counselor and he went around counseling woman after woman, having adultery with them, disciplined from churches and just went from one church to the next coming in as the smiley guy that knew everything and could counsel, and he would find these ladies and counsel them and end up into immorality. Their eyes and their lusts sparkle. And when they see a woman weighed down with burdens and newly saved and still struggling with this old life, those are the victims. And look with me in verse 19. They promise freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome... By this is he enslaved. They promise you freedom. <clears throat> they take a half truth because there is freedom in the Christian life. My freedom is to be a slave to Jesus Christ. My freedom is to do what is right for the first time in my life. I have been set free to follow the King of Kings. It's the most blessed freedom that I have. I love serving Christ. <laughs> So we have a blessed freedom. And they come now, but they take that freedom and they pervert it and twist it. It's a freedom to do what? What is this freedom? They now say you have a freedom to do evil. You can go where sin uh, abounded, grace abounded, all the more you are free. Continue in sin. You're not, uh, you are not really free. Second uh, 
Peter 1, chapter 4, he said, For by these he's granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by these promises you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. God's gospel delivers you out of that, and these false teachers are putting you back into it. They're leading you and guiding you right back into the smut. Freedom to, to the false teacher is to pursue your desires and lusts without any fear because of this false gospel. No self-control that we learn in chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, that we are growing in self-control and perseverance in it. The false teacher takes these glorious truths and he calls them freedom. He twists it so he can pursue his sexual freedom. Galatians 5, Paul says, For you are called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. That's what they're doing. It's an opportunity to the flesh. Freedom, flesh. Go at it. Have at it. Instead of freedom to serve one another in love. That's what God set you free for. And so the promise of freedom, they're promising you freedom while they're just slaves of corruption. How many have taught this freedom while picking up women and prostitutes on the side from authors, pastors, speakers, elders, the list goes on and on and on. I will give this message, will give you freedom while I'm on the side with prostitutes. But if the Son has made you free, you shall be free indeed. The blessed freedom of the children of God. I pray you treasure that this morning. We have the freedom to pursue Jesus Christ. I get the freedom to pursue what I love every day. I pray that uh, on, on Independence Day, I love the freedom that we have in America, but every day is my Independence Day. Treasure the freedom that you have this morning to love Christ and follow after Him. What a blessed freedom. And don't you dare let any false teacher come and give you a lie that freedom is to pursue your flesh. That's your portrait of false teachers. Punishment, the presumption, their practices, full of sensuality, lusts, and greed, and their promises are freedom. Well, they'll make you a slave. And this morning, what we're going to close out with is the product of their teaching. If you'll look with me in verse 20. <coughs> where, do, where does all this go? Why is pastor so passionate about this? Well, for if after they've escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed to them. This could be one of the strongest warnings in the whole, all of Scripture. This is someone who professes to be a Christian and they turn away from the defilements of the world that they were living in and they kind of clean up their, their life. And then later, they forsake that way of righteousness. The false teachers are lying and, and they might even start buying it and, and they start believing that I, I really can live any way I want and this sexual sin and all this stuff does not matter. And you just start sinking into it and you buy it and you get into it deeper and deeper and deeper. And the condition that you will find yourselves in if there is not repentance. I want you to hear this. Every believer is battling sin. That's not what I'm saying. This is the one who gives himself to that false teaching and you come under it and, and he says you're, you're going to be controlled by it now and it's going to own you. And as you go then, the condition that you will end up in will be worse than if you never knew about Jesus Christ. It would be better if you had never heard the way of righteousness. The condition that you're going to end in is terrifying. So sobering. And I want to flesh this out. I want you to hear what Jesus said about it. He said in uh, Matthew 12 that when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, <coughs> it passes through waterless places seeking rest, and it doesn't find rest. And then it says, I will return to my house from which I came, from this person. And when it comes, it finds it unoccupied, swept and put in order. You know what that means? He's had a moral transformation and the Spirit of God is not there. And so it comes back, and here's this little moral squeaky guy, and it comes back, and there's nothing there, so I'm coming back in. I'm back. And then it goes, and it takes along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself. 
I'm going to come back with seven buddies, demons. And because it's nothing in there, we're going back in. And they go in and they live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. That is the way it will be with this evil generation, said Jesus. Moral reform is deadly. And to just sweep yourself up, this is what, what I hate about legalism and fundamentalism and all these things that have grown in America, is it's teaching you how to clean yourself up without the power of this gospel and the Spirit of God doing it. And what it will produce, and I've seen it again and again, is you'll be seven times, ten times worse than you were before you tried to clean yourself up. And I bet all of you have a testimony of someone you've had to watch and see this reality happen and it rips your heart out. So let me drill down into these words because it's, it's a razor's edge. We can fall off into heresy on either side this morning. So in verse 20, <coughs> verse 20, for if after they've escaped the defilements of the world, uh, this is the, the, the cleaning up. This is the whole liberal movement in our day, in our seminaries, in our churches, just moralism. We want you to just be, be good guys, better people. And so if you do that, uh, how, how did they clean themselves up? This is scary to me. How do these people clean themselves up? What does our text say? By the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How did they morally clean up? By Christ. The, and I want you to catch this. By the knowledge, it's not epigenosis of what we learned in chapter 1. It's not this full knowledge of relationship and communion with Christ. This is just academics. You know the doctrines. You've heard them and you, you understand them with your mind. But you've never been born again. They come in. The doctrines of Christ and Christianity and its, its tenets have caused you to clean yourself up morally. And so it wasn't Muhammad or Joseph Smith that caused them to change. They turned to the truths about Jesus Christ for a moral reformation. The teaching that they would clean up their lives with was Christianity. That was their religion of choice. I picked Christianity to have this moral reformation and be a better person, to be the best version of Ken Murphy. I picked that. <laughs> it's all over. That's, the, that's what I choose. The church is so full of these kind of people. And what breaks my heart as a pastor is there's some of them sitting in here this morning. And I just hear testimony after testimony is your Christianity is you, you cleaned up your life and you have no relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not vibrant and real. It's not strong. You are dead to Christ. No affections and no love for Him. And your, your morality is, 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 is waning. And you are entering into these sexual sins of this country and what we're all about and you're taking these steps right back into it. You're the ones who are denying your master with your sexual desires. And you got some academic knowledge of Christianity that comforts your head when you put it on the pillow. And Peter's taking that and he's pulling it out this morning. And what I want you to notice in these terms that Peter's using in verse 20, there's not one salvific term in it. And so for believer in Christ, I want you to hear that. These are not believers. Okay, these are false professors. In verse 20, it says they cleaned up and they escaped the defilements of the world. And so there's nothing here about salvation. It's just a moral reformation with religious truth about Christ. They love all the terms and they talk about it even, but it cannot change a heart. Religion, Christianity, all of its doctrine cannot change your heart just to nod to it. It's not enough. That's what Peter's saying. You can look at that and change and clean up, but you're going to be in big trouble in the long run. Jesus said, unless you're born again, you will not enter into the kingdom of God. Unless you're taken from spiritual death and brought to spiritual life where sin reigned and now Christ reigns in your life and you have love and affections for Him, you're dead. And all of your moral cleaning up and all of your external knowledge means nothing before Jesus. You must be born again if you're going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's a supernatural phenomenon that only God can do. And there's so many just sitting in morality who are going to breathe their last and stand before this Christ. 
And I want everyone in this room to say, Pastor Murphy told me that was a lie and he fought me, if that's your condition here this morning. And I do it out of love for your soul. And if he says you've cleaned up and then you are again entangled in all this gross immorality that your, your testimony was, you've been set free from it. And now you get into this false teaching and you start letting up from 1 Peter, 2 Peter 1, and you're just playing with Jesus. And you play. And all of a sudden, these sins begin to entangle you. And they get stronger and deeper and more controlling. And you get back into them. You're, and all of a sudden, you're right back into all the smut that controlled you before your supposed salvation. You're right back to what you were in Adam, the same crowd you ran with, you the same desires you had, everything. Just worse. Many times worse than you were even before. You're more immoral than when you were this sweet little teenage girl fighting for purity. And now you just jump on Tinder and chase guys and girls and you do whatever you want. You're worse than you were before. That's what happens without a gospel. Moral transformation, empty promises with no power. There's no power in your life. And there's so much religion in our day that it just breaks my heart. And what happens to these people? Why does this matter? He says the last state has become worse for them than the first. The state that you sit in here this morning is worse than you were before this supposed change of life. You're in a worse place than you ever were. Because the, the truth that was supposed to change and transform you didn't. And I just want to read a couple of verses that we need the, the Spirit to help us understand. Matthew 12. Well, I've, I've already looked at that one. That's where the Spirit comes and you clean up. <clears throat> the other one is in Hebrews 6. Um, I think we have this recorded when Pastor Conwell taught through it. But he's talking about, he says, in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and uh, I, I've always held that word as it, it's associated with it. Uh, they're in the midst of the power of God. Some of you have sat here and you've watched people on these testimonies be born again, redeemed, people in this church being conformed to the image of Christ. You're watching the power of God on a daily basis. And you've tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. And then you fall away. It's impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucified themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame. I, I, I got nothing more for you. You looked at Jesus and saw His beauty and His power in the church, and you've looked at all of these things, and you said, you know what? I'd, I'm going back to Judaism. Jesus isn't enough. You go back, there's nothing more to help you. You looked at the promises and the glory and the beauties of Christ, and you walked away. It's impossible to help you. It's impossible. Write down Hebrews 10, 26 through 29. I need to keep moving. It's Communion Sunday. <clears throat> Second, uh, 2 Peter 2.21 For it would have been better for these people to have not known the way of righteousness, the gospel, than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed down to them. It, it would be better if you never heard this. This would be better than the state you're going to be in at the end of this. And to play around with false teachers, to play around with sin, is a dangerous thing. And this chapter has done much for my own heart. To just sit and play with sin is a dangerous slope. And this is, this is a call that we stay diligent in chapter 1 to grow in these things, verses 5-7 through seven of chapter 1. Diligence. And so he showed the beauties of Christ that you would swim so hard toward him. And now he's showing the fear of the one who quits swimming. You're going to be 10 miles down by this current of the world, the flesh, and the devil. And some of you are in that current right now and you're just drifting. And my fear is that there needs to be repentance. Repentance is what stops this drift. And now I'm just praying this morning as you hear these words that there would be massive repentance in Southside Bible Church for those who've been petting this and playing with it and, and listening to false teaching. And it could be in your own mind that you're just playing and saying it's okay. I know so many kids who grew up in the church and you just start thinking it's okay. I know teenagers and all this, you just play with it. 
And it's okay. There's, no, there's nothing. I'm just once saved, always saved. There's nothing to be worried about. And this tells you right now, there's a profession that doesn't lead to heaven. And there's a, there's a playing around with sin that is a dangerous thing. And then he closes with a beautiful proverb in verse 22. <coughs> it has happened... It has happened to them, these people, according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its vomit and a so after washing returns to wallowing in the mire. And I've always looked at that illustration of if you take a pig and you wash it off and put a little necklace on it and some perfume and you just say, you know, what a cute little piggy. (laughs) It's just, here's my pet pig. And you don't want it to mess up your carpet and it's in your house but the minute it sees mud, it's just by nature, it's a pig. And it just jumps right back in the, the, the mud and is so happy. And he's saying, this is, this is it, is you just morally clean yourself up and your heart didn't get changed. And you're going to go jump back into this slop of the corruption of this world, living by your lusts and your desires and your sensualities. And you'll just plop right back in the mud going, this is my nature, this is what I really love. And that's the danger of what we're looking at this morning. So two points I just want to clarify before we close up this section. There's a principle here. The more that you know about Christ, knowledge, not epinosis, the more severe your punishment will be for rejecting Him. This has always been a truth that kind of shakes me. Jesus said this in Luke 12. And that a slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will, you knew your master's will and you wouldn't do it. They're going to receive many lashes. But the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a flogging, outright immoral, never knew the gospel, they're going to receive but few. And for everyone who has been given, much shall be required. And to whom he's been entrusted, much of him they will ask all the more. The hottest places in hell are for the false teachers and for those who have the most knowledge of Christ and just morally cleaned yourself up and you would never come to Him that you would find life. You just played around with Christianity all of your days and you would never come to this sweet Christ. And so is the answer to to flee and say, I better quit hearing sermons because I'm just stoking the fires. Hell is hell. I don't care where you're at. If it's at the beginning or the end, the heights or the bottoms, it's hell. The only answer is get saved. Cry out. Sit in desperation this morning and say, I'm in trouble. I'm in big trouble. And I'm not, I got to be saved. My moral cleanup and all of these things have done nothing for me. Oh God, call upon the name of the Lord and he will come and rescue you out of this pit of morality with religion that's done nothing for you. Some of you have 30 years of morality and no change. No new birth and affections for Christ that are changing you from one image of glory to the next. This is a call to call to Jesus. Cry out, save me. My morality can't do it. My morality by knowledge of Christian doctrine has not broken the power of sin in my heart. Cry. Don't look to your hands or resolves or morality to get out of this place. Call on Jesus Christ this morning and be saved. That's what He wants from you. Don't run back to morality. Run to the Savior who says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden with your morality and I'm going to give you rest for your souls. Oh, what a glorious gospel. Today could be your day of visitation. I pray for any moral people who have never been saved, come to Jesus this morning. He, He holds hands out and bids you. He wants to give you this life. Oh my Second, Peter is not teaching that God's children can lose their salvation. Just perish that thought. This isn't believers. This is false professors who just take this stuff and lap it up and do not repent. The, the, the key to a believer is I repent. You know what, you know what salvation did? It took the pleasures of sin away, at least for maybe a minute. It's just gone. All that happens is conscience and heart. And Jesus has loved me and given his life. I hate this. <laughs> it promised to make me happy and it doesn't. I love that Jesus took away all my fun and sin. Now my fun is in obeying him and knowing him 
and loving Him. Hallelujah. So this is just people with a profession. You've cleaned the outside of the cup, but the inside is filthy. You have external conformity, but you do not have internal reality of 2 Peter chapter 1 that pastor spent way too much time on, but you need it. So you should not be surprised that someone can make a really good start and fall away. John said they went out from us because they were never from us. And if they were, they wouldn't have went out from us. And so don't be surprised. There are going to be some that aren't going to be here next year. And they're going to walk away. Matthew 10 says, You will be hated, Jesus said, by all on account of my name. But it's the one who endures to the end who's going to be saved. It's going to be the one who will never let go of Jesus to the very end and swimming toward conformity to him. Please don't let go. Keep swimming. Keep pursuing this Christ. And I've told you before, it's his hands holding yours so you'll never let go. But your responsibility is don't let go of Jesus. Don't, don't sell him for anything in this world. And Colossians 1, 23, Paul says, If you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you've heard, don't get moved away from this gospel. Don't get led, led away from the hope that you have. Don't get led astray and go into the false teaching and become enslaved to all of this stuff. Because it was proclaimed in all creation under heaven of which I, Paul, was made a minister. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, believers, in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. You better hold to this. That's what shows that you are the true. You make it to the very end, holding to Christ. And some of you don't fear that, and you're sitting here playing with all this sexual sin, and it's going to ensnare you, and there's a danger, and you better be careful. Because you've got to make it to the end in these promises and these hopes. And so this morning, throw this stuff down. Believers, don't play with this sin. Guys, we need Christ and His Word and truth to make it to the end in persevering faith, faith in Christ alone and fellowship with Him and working out this righteousness to grow in these traits in 5-7. through seven. Not to abandon it to some false teaching that's abounding in our day and age and find yourself worse off than you were at the end of this. I hate that. I see, I've seen it so many times. And then they're just cold to any gospel truth. Wouldn't that be awful to hear about Christ and just have nothing in your heart toward Him. But God's elect in chapter 1 cannot do that. Do you remember in verse 10, the point of the whole letter was to make certain your calling and election. If the elect could be lost, there would be no advantage in confirming it. The bottom line is you, are the elect of God, true children of God, you can't fall. You're not going to go into this. But you've got to be diligent and make certain of what we saw in chapter 1. So the elect of God are never going to let go of Jesus because God has said so. He's decreed it. It's powerful. But there needs to be these, these little uh, bumpers need to go up this morning in your little bowling alley, okay? You need some bumpers. And these bumpers are let this warning wake you up and guard your heart against this false teaching and false living. This is a letter for us to confirm our election. It's warning us to... To, to not get brought into false teaching and deny our master by immorality, to resist the temptations of pride, love of money, and sexual licentiousness. And so guys, this has not been an easy chapter. But our great God felt it necessary for his children. And it's to increase your earnestness to confirm your election. And I, I want some oaks. <laughs> I don't want a bunch of dandelions that dissolve when a little bit of wind comes. And so I pray, I pray that the way Peter said in chapter 1 is, is the way to stay on this is to not forget your former purification of your sins. That on the cross, Jesus hung and died for every sin that you ever committed. I'll separate him as far as the east is from the west. I'll wash you. I'll cleanse you. 
I'll bring you to. And, and when you're holding that and treasuring it, you won't chase all this other stuff. There, there's a power in the gospel and the cross. And so we're going to close out this morning by coming and looking at this cross where every sin has been forgiven. Have you forgotten how beautiful this cross is? And as you look at this, it's also the power to overcome sin and to fight against all these temptations that we're all battling and in, in, in this war together. So the answer isn't go pull yourself up by your bootstraps. The answer is look at the loveliness of Christ dying on a cross in your place. And when you see that, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done with all that other stuff. So let's all just look our eyes out this morning at the beauty of a, of a Savior crucified on our behalf on Calvary's tree. So let's pray and then I'll ask the, the ushers to come and pass out the elements. Father, I thank you. This is a sobering warning. I pray that you'll do your work in every heart. God, every one of us need uh, to be sifted out. And so I pray by your spirit now through this word that you will give what every person needs individually and specifically to their own heart. God, let no believer spiral under this, but let them look at a cross and, and be more diligent than they've ever been to grow in these things of excellence, moral excellence. God, I pray that you would do a mighty work now in your people, and I pray that the cross would be sweeter than ever. No one can drift and run away holding Christ in their hands as a crucified Savior, seated at your right hand, interceding on our behalf this day. Oh God, let the beauties of Christ cause every heart to repent of any decays in piety. And God, revive them in love to him and obedience and righteousness to this King. God, do your work that no man can do, we pray. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.